48, we'll be taking a look at the anatomy and physiology of the human nervous system. The following diagram illustrates some of the major divisions of the human nervous system. The first major division is the central nervous system, comprised of the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is comprised of all nerves that lie outside the brain and spinal cord. This division of the nervous system can be further subdivided into a somatic division, which primarily controls the voluntary actions of skeletal muscle, and the autonomic division, which primarily controls the activities of smooth or involuntary muscles. The autonomic nervous system can be further subdivided into a sympathetic and parasympathetic division, the functions of which will be discussed later on in this presentation. Our investigation of the human nervous system will start with an in-depth look at the central nervous system, which, of course, as previously mentioned, is composed of the brain and the spinal cord. As you can see, the brain is primarily adapted for the integration of sensory stimuli and the formulation of motor command impulses. Some of the higher functions of the brain include cognition or thinking, memory, language, and of course emotion. The spinal cord, which is intimately associated with the brain, is primarily adapted for channeling impulses between the brain and the body. As we will see later on in this presentation, it can also control reflex responses. The brain and the spinal cord are surrounded by a series of membranes which are collectively referred to as meninges. These membranes include the pia, the arachnoid, and the dura matter, the spaces in between which are occupied by cerebrospinal fluid, which is primarily adapted for cushioning the brain and the spinal cord to protect them against mechanical shock. In previous discussions, we illustrated how the brain and the spinal cord developed a dorsal hollow nerve cord during the early stages of embryonic development in a process known as neurulation. If you remember, this process involves the infolding of an ectodermal plate found on the dorsal surface of the embryo. This infolding will ultimately break away from the outer ectoderm, forming a dorsal hollow nerve cord, which will later differentiate into the brain and the spinal cord. Interestingly, the hollow region of the dorsal hollow nerve cord is actually preserved as this structure continues to differentiate into the brain and spinal cord. The hollow regions within the brain that are derived from this hollow are referred to as ventricles. It is these regions within which cerebrospinal fluid is actually produced and is circulated throughout all of the other ventricles and the spaces between the meninges. As this diagram shows, cerebrospinal fluid is produced by certain specialized capillary complexes that are found in certain ventricles within the brain. These capillary complexes allow for the filtration of blood plasma from these capillaries out into the brain ventricles. The resulting solution is composed primarily of water, ions, vitamins, and certain nutrients, collectively referred to as cerebrospinal fluid. Produced, the cerebrospinal fluid can be circulated throughout the brain by a series of ciliated cells that line the ventricles. Some important functions of cerebrospinal fluid include the following. As previously mentioned, this fluid can help to cushion the brain and the spinal cord against mechanical shock. In addition, cerebrospinal fluid can deliver certain vital nutrients to and absorb metabolic waste from the cells of the brain and the spinal cord. Finally, cerebrospinal fluid can help the brain achieve neutral buoyancy. In other words, it neither floats nor sinks in this fluid, 
and it allows brains to grow relatively large without being damaged by its own weight. Here we can see a comparison between the capillaries that are found in the brain as opposed to those found elsewhere in the body. Most capillaries throughout the body are characterized by a series of gaps between cells that make up the capillary wall. And these gaps allow for various solutes within the blood to pass out of the capillary into the surrounding tissue. These capillaries aren't terribly selective for anything tends to pass through the vessel wall as long as it is small enough to fit through these gaps. In contrast to those found elsewhere in the body, capillaries within the brain are characterized by the presence of tight junctions between cells that make up the capillary wall. As a result, brain capillaries are much more selective than those found elsewhere in the body. Only lipid-soluble substances, such as those listed here, have a tendency to pass directly through these cells into brain tissue. Those substances that aren't lipid-soluble either cannot pass from the vessel or require special transport systems to do so. These capillaries that are found in the brain make up what is known as the blood-brain barrier. This is a highly selective system that ensures that only certain prescribed substances can pass from the bloodstream and interact with the tissue of the brain. Graham illustrates, the brain could be divided into three general regions, a forebrain, composed of a thalamus, hypothalamus, and cerebrum, a hindbrain, composed of the pons, cerebellum, and medulla, as well as a midbrain, which contains the audio-visual reflex centers, the superior and inferior colliculi, respectively. If many of you remember, this was the region of the brain that I stimulated when I kicked over the garbage can. You should have seen the look on some of your faces. The hindbrain and midbrain are collectively referred to as the brainstem. Going forward, we will expand on the structure and function of each one of these brain regions. The hindbrain is one of the most primitive regions of the brain. And with regards to the hindbrain, we'll first take a look at the medulla and the pons. The pons can be regarded as a relay center, transmitting signals from higher brain centers, such as the cerebrum, to the cerebellum or to the medulla. Likewise, the pons can transmit signals to higher brain regions as well. With regards to the medulla, this region of the brain lies immediately below the pons at the very top of the spinal column and it is adapted for stimulating most all involuntary actions of the body, which include breathing, the regulation of heart rate, digestive activity, sneezing, coughing, swallowing, and even vomiting. Because the medulla is adapted for regulating vital activities, any damage to this region of the brain is generally An important point to make about the medulla is that this region of the brain is the site where nerve tracts descending from the right and the left hemisphere of the cerebrum cross over. This crossing over of nerve tractways is known as decussation. And this explains why the right and left hemispheres process sensory information and send motor commands to the opposite side of the body. The effects of decussation are most readily observable in patients that have suffered damage, such as a stroke, to regions of the brain dedicated to conscious motor control. As a result of this damage, these patients 
have motor functions that are adversely affected on the opposite side of their body. Therefore, a right hemispheric stroke in such a motor cortex would affect motor activity on the left side of their body and vice versa. The medulla and the pons, the hindbrain also includes the cerebellum. The cerebellum is the second largest region of the brain and as we can see, it is highly folded or convoluted and has the highest concentration of neurons anywhere in the brain. The functions of the cerebellum is to help the body maintain a state of balance. The cerebellum accomplishes this by processing information from our visual field as well as from our inner ear with regards to the position of the body in space. As the body moves, the cerebellum will subsequently stimulate and adjust the position of certain muscles in order to maintain a constant state of balance. Another major function of the cerebellum is to refine muscle movements so that they are nice and smooth. Let's consider the following example. Let's suppose that an individual attempts to perform a back leg kick as seen here. This activity will start with a command from the motor command center in the cerebral cortex. This signal will travel to lower brain centers, first the pons, which will then relay this signal to the cerebellum. From the cerebellum, this signal will then travel down the spinal column to the effectors in the lower leg, which will then carry out this activity. The cerebellum will then proceed to match up the actual movement of the leg with the original command signal from the motor cortex in the cerebrum. If the two don't exactly match up, the cerebellum will make adjustments so that the actual movement of these effectors matches very closely with the prescribed movement from the motor command center in the cerebrum. With regards to the forebrain, the largest region of this portion of the brain is represented by the cerebrum. The cerebrum is the site of sensory integration, motor output, and various cognitive functions. Most specifically, we are concerned with the outermost portion of the cerebrum, often known as the cerebral cortex. As we can see, the cerebral cortex is highly folded or convoluted. These folds or convolutions increase the surface area of this region of the brain for the processing of the aforementioned activities. Finally, we can see that the cerebrum is divided by a very deep fissure or groove which divides this portion of the brain into a right and a left cerebral hemisphere. C. The right and the left cerebral hemisphere can be further subdivided into lobes which bear the name of the region of the skull under which they are found. We have a frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal lobe. Although both sides of the brain are adapted for processing sensory stimuli and initiating motor commands, there are some functions for which each hemisphere is specifically adapted. This is a phenomenon known as lateralization. Therefore, in other words, there are some functions for which the right cerebral hemisphere is specifically adapted, and there are some functions for which the left hemisphere is specifically adapted. The following diagram provides a summary of all of the functions of each of the lobes of the cerebral cortex. To the frontal lobe, 
This region of the brain is associated with primarily reasoning skills. This area of the brain also shows the highest degree of lateralization or specialization between the right and the left cerebral hemispheres. So we'll expand more on that lateralization going forward. Now at the back of the frontal lobe, we have what is known as the primary motor cortex. This region right in here controls all voluntary activity of skeletal muscle throughout the body. And each region of this motor cortex corresponds specifically to a particular region of the body such that the entire body can be faithfully mapped out along this region of the frontal lobe. Located directly behind the frontal lobe lies the parietal lobe. One of the most significant regions of the parietal lobe is the primary somatic sensory cortex. This region, which lies immediately behind the primary motor cortex, is adapted for processing sensory information from various regions throughout the body. Like the primary motor cortex, each region of this so-called somatosensory cortex corresponds specifically to a particular body part, such that, once again, the entire body can be faithfully mapped out along this region of the parietal lobe. Located at the rearmost portion of the cerebrum lies the occipital lobe. This is the region of the cerebral cortex that is adapted for processing images. So this region of the brain is the primary visual cortex. This is followed by the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe is where the auditory cortex resides for processing audio stimuli, as well as the gustatory and olfactory cortices, which are adapted for processing tastes and smells respectively. As previously mentioned, the anterior portion of the frontal lobe, that is to say the frontmost portion of the frontal lobe, exhibits the highest degree of lateralization or specialization between the right and the left cerebral hemispheres compared to any other region of the brain. With regards to the degree of lateralization that we observe in the left cerebral hemisphere, there are regions that are specialized for the processing of both written and spoken language. There are other regions, especially towards the anterior end of the frontal lobe, that are adapted for analytical reasoning, such as that which might be helpful in solving math problems or thinking critically in science. With regards to the speech centers that are specific to the left cerebral hemisphere, Wernicke's area, which is found in the parietal lobe, is adapted for the interpretation of the spoken language, whereas Broca's area, which is found in the frontal lobe, is adapted for initiating movements of the muscles in the face, the lips, and the tongue in order to enable an individual to physically form words. To illustrate how these two speech centers within the left cerebral hemisphere interact with one another, suppose that somebody asks you how you walk. This information would first enter into the auditory cortex of the temporal lobe, which would then be passed on to Wernicke's area. This would enable you to interpret the greeting and to also formulate an appropriate response. This information would then be passed to Broca's area, which would then stimulate the muscles of the face, the lips, and the tongue so that you can physically speak your response. 
in contrast to the left cerebral hemisphere, the right cerebral hemisphere also exhibits a high degree of lateralization for certain activities. One of those is the ability for this region of the brain to recognize patterns as well as faces. So we owe the ability to recognize the face of people close to us to this region of the brain. The right cerebral hemisphere is also specifically adapted for helping us to negotiate the world around us in terms of helping us judge the spatial relationship or how objects relate to each other in space. This is also the cerebral hemisphere that is adapted for artistic expression. In addition to the cerebrum, another significant region of the forebrain is represented by the thalamus. The thalamus can be regarded as a major relay center of the brain, responsible for relaying a variety of sensory stimuli, as shown here, to higher brain regions which can properly process or interpret those stimuli. The region of the forebrain is represented by the hypothalamus. As its name suggests, this region of the brain is located immediately below the thalamus. The hypothalamus is often regarded as the big brother of the brain because it is well adapted for constantly monitoring a wide variety of physiological conditions, such as blood sugar concentration, body temperature, and various other vital activities. If there are any changes in these activities, the hypothalamus will stimulate the pituitary gland, itself located immediately below the hypothalamus. This will result in the release of various hormones, which will stimulate other endocrine glands in the body in order to counteract these changes and to maintain a stable internal state or homeostasis. We will expand on the relationship between the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and other endocrine glands throughout the body in the next chapter on the endocrine system. For now, we should regard the hypothalamus as a physical link between these two regulatory systems of the body.